transdisciplinary. Um, thanks. So we we'll start with recording now. Um, so without uh, further ado, um, I'll hand over to our first speaker, Esther. Um, Esther, please let me know if I should share the presentation or if you will share the screen. So is Esther here? I think she's not here yet. Okay. So we we wait for Esther. In the meantime, feel free to introduce yourself. Um, on it's okay. I'll try looking for Esther. Thanks. <laughs> Otherwise, we could start with any of the other presentations that are present. Um, and shift them around, but we have a little bit of time. Yeah, we have a little bit of time, and I also. Uh, I think we have to stick a little bit to the agenda. So if people want to join for a talk, that they don't use it. Um, another minute or so. Any of you guys have a, a number of Esther or know, know her well and can get in touch with her. So we're waiting for her to start with the first presentation. Try finding her email from the writing retreat, but then I'm not sure how fast and efficient email is for communication. Joshina, would you be uh, able to start early? Uh, yes, I could. Okay. <laughs> Just uh, give it another one or two minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. Ah, I see that Esther is here now. Esther is here now. Perfect. Excellent. <laughs> well, worth waiting. So, hi, Esther. Can you hear us? And hi. are you there? Hi. hi. Welcome. I'm sorry, I went to the wrong uh, screen. Sorry. No worries. So, uh, glad uh, to have you here. Um, you are supposed to give the first presentation. So do you want me to share the presentation or do you want to share the screen? Um, let me share it. I hope you can see it now. Okay. Well, thank you so much. My name is Esther Mazala. I am a finalist, uh, just completed my fourth year in Kenyatta University, and um, I was pursuing Bachelor in Sciences, Coastal Marine and Resource Management. So my title for today is uh, The Effects of COVID-19 on marine social ecological systems in the Mar Mombasa Marine National Park and Reserve. I was looking at the lessons for management um, and these are my co-others. 
So moving on, um, by, uh, we need to understand the marine social ecological systems and what they are. So they are a form of human nature interaction. And in this case, we're going to be looking at interaction of the coastal people and the marine resources. Therefore, um, I understand that marine protected areas are a good example of how conservation by excluding people from extracting marine resources has thrived. Um, therefore, I'll be looking at how marine parks have contributed to helping in regulating the interaction between people and marine resources, especially the people in the coastal areas. Um, tourist activities are majorly, majorly occur in the park area, while fishing activities majorly occur in the reserve area. Um, we see this majorly because tourists tend to go to the park areas for uh, diving and uh, watching the corals and sometimes also fishing. Uh, but fishing activities mainly occur in the reserve area and KWS is doing a good job in um, protecting the, the marine resources, but still there is a, a little bit of decline in the marine resources that has been um, going on. Therefore, my problem statement for this study is that in Kenya, we experienced COVID-19 mostly around it was around March last year, and uh, this prompted lockdowns, and um, there was a shift in activities in the marine areas, in the in the marine protected areas, because fishing activities and tourist tourism was affected highly, and uh, people were withdrawn from the marine park, and therefore that they had they had to they had to withdraw from their activities because these people are coastal dependent and they depend on the marine resources. Um, therefore, there are, there's need for embracing alternative means of livelihoods, especially during this time of COVID-19, majorly to those who are dependent on the coastal resources for their uh, livelihood. COVID-19 was also a very good and natural setup to understand the impact of excluding people from utilizing marine resources and understand understanding also the impact of lack of alternative livelihoods for the people. Um, my major objective was to assess the effect of COVID-19 on the marine social ecological systems and understand also the lessons learned from um, for management actions that can be embraced. And my specific objectives was to de determine the effect of COVID-19 on tourist sector, fishing activity, and marine ecosystem. Second one was to determine the action of management for marine social ecological systems that can be derived from lessons learned from the effects um, that COVID had in the above sectors. Um, my research questions that were to help me um, answer uh, or get data in the, uh, on the ground when I went to interact with the fishermen and the tourist agents um, were First one was to understand how COVID affected the tourist activities at the Mombasa Marine Park and Reserve. The other one was to understand um, how was the health of the coral reefs made mainly affected or influenced by the COVID-19 um, at the park and reserve area. And also were there alternative sources of livelihoods that people embraced during this time after they were evicted from or removed from that area and also what were the dynamics of the fishers and the fishing vessels during this time of COVID? And also finally the management lessons that they learned. Um, my study area, if you can, uh, as you can see here, is uh, the Mombasa Marine Park and National Park and Reserve. It's located at the coast of Kenya um, in East Africa coast. And uh, it runs all the way from Bamburi Beach to Nata Beach all the way. Um, the park area, it, it covers 10 kilometers squared, while the reserve area covers 200 kilometers squared. And also the, the reef uh, runs all the way to Finju. Um, also one thing I got to understand about this park and marine park, Mombasa Marine Park and Reserve is that it was start, 
or it was established at in 1986 and um, in 1994 that's when it was able to have full protection from from the night patrols that were introduced so it was until 1994 then it was it became like fully under protection um so my methodology that i used i was able to use questionnaire sheets and my my study my survey um, went from the month june to august of this year and i was able to interact with fishers and tourist agents including boat owners kws ticketing agents and divers and others of course and i was able to interact with them and um, for some of them, I had to translate to them the questionnaire sheets, but I was able to get um, the permission from the KWS one then, and I was able to go to the ground and interact with them. Um, the secondary data, I was also able to acquire it from Kempri and KWS on the ecological system and the health of the, the corals during this time. My data analysis, I was able to um, summarize and uh, the information I got from the questionnaires and I was able to summarize them into percentages and frequencies and means so I can be able to uh, display them in tables and graphs. Well, on to my results is um, COVID-19 was a blessing in this guys and it was also, um, it also brought about different dynamics for the people who are coastal dependent because um, I was able to interact with the fishers and the tourist agents and the, 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 number, the number that I was able to interact with was 40 people, 87.5% were the male and 12.5% were female. Um, this table shows the questions that I use on my questionnaires and the responses that the people in the, the tourist agents gave me and I was able to come up with this table so I can summarize well what what they responded and when I interacted with them and asked them how COVID affected their tourist activities 75 percent of them said that there was a lack of tourist visits um, and also a few of them said that beach businesses were highly affected and they only depended on local tourists, a few of them. And also they said that there was a drastic drop, 100% of them said that there was a drastic drop in tourist visits. And um, also they perceived that there was a high pollution levels before the pandemic and there was a gradual drop in the in the pollution levels especially after the COVID-19 came in and people were withdrawn from the park and reserve area. Um, I was able to use uh, the indicators of boats to understand how the number of boats changed during this time and this is a table showing how the, the number of boats that were being recorded monthly before the pandemic and this was during the pandemic and you can see there's a huge drop in the number of boats and uh, also they responded about the suspension of workers from the park 80 percent of them said that they were completely withdrawn from the park and reserve area and also like 10 percent said that they were not withdrawn and i got to understand that these are mainly like the beach money beach managers who are only left there to protect take care of the park and um, yes so the effect of COVID on the fishing sector was um, very um, it was a, was it was a very significant because the number of fishers and the fishing vessels reduced at a very high 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 rate um, you can see from how we have understood that the vessels, the number of vessels that were going to the park and the reserve, they drastically dropped. And then there was a huge loss in both the local and international market for their fish that they used to fish during that time. And then um, later on, fishers, they didn't have any alternative livelihood because you can see from this graph, 80% of them said that they didn't have an, any alternative source of livelihood when they were withdrawn from the park and reserve area. 
So only uh, uh, only fishers who had permits were allowed to continue fishing only during the daytime. But they, after the cattle time, they were not allowed to be in the reserve area. And also the fishers, they perceived that um, there was uh, fish population had increased, was increasing gradually during this um, time of the pandemic with the little population that was in the reserve area. Um, finally, um, the effects of COVID on the marine ecosystem, mainly coral reefs, um, I was able to get the perception of the people and um, I, I asked, uh, I was able to ask them if the pandemic had affected the reserve ecosystem and its resources and how it had affected them. And a huge percentage of them said that it had affected the resources positively. And also they also said that the pollution levels had gradually dropped. And um, I, I was also, I, I also asked them if the fishing activity is had reduced during this time, did it lead to a an increase in the fish population because I needed to understand this. And most of them say that yes, there was an increase in the fish population, especially after they had gone for a few months and then they came back to continue fishing due to the lack of any other alternative uh, livelihood that they would have done. And also, I also asked them if they felt that the drop in tourism had affected where they fish and um, some say that it doesn't affect, tourists don't affect where they fish, and a huge number of them say that the fish habitats had flourished. Um, I was also able to get data from KWS on the benthic cover of the corals uh, in the marine, Mombasa Marine Park and Reserve, and um, you can see that between the year 2018 and 2021, you can still say that there was a decline in the cover of um, hard coral algae, tough algae, and macro algae. Um, so onto my discussion, um, I'd say that there is a concern um, or a perception that mobile, um, marine protected areas around the world are mostly legislative or poorly enforced. Uh, what we mainly say the paper parks and the probably do not effectively provide protection for the marine ecosystem because as you can see that there's only 0.08% of the world's oceans and 0.2% of the total marine area are under some form of national jurisdiction or strictly protected. And we have a goal of achieving 30% of strictly protected uh, marine protected areas. Therefore, we still have a long way to go and that's why I felt it's important to understand different lessons of management that we can embrace since we understand that people were excluded from the marine protected areas and there was a positive impact uh, to the marine resources. Um, what I'd recommend is um, management agencies would um, embrace upscaling of marine protected areas. They would uh, in Introduce um, redesigning or designation of protected areas um, in terms of probably reducing the area that is being exploited by coastal independent people, or probably the area that is under restriction, total restriction, maybe. Um, I hope you can hear me. Okay, the area that is under total restriction, maybe fully protected or enlarged zonation or redesigning may help probably understanding that when you subdivide the part of a marine protected area, it would cause an other area of the marine protected, the marine park to flourish and repopulate and therefore allowing um, like the marine resources and ecosystem to have um, a phase where they re-flourish and come back to their health conditions away from the pressure from humans because marine resources in themselves, they are okay. It's the human resources, it's the human um, activities that bring about pressure upon them. Therefore, um, um, for every past marine ecosystem management interventions, 
I would um, I would say that it would be important to reassess if they they meet the objective of marine protected areas, and if they don't, they might consider uh, refrain. Re they might consider doing them or probably improving in one way or another. And also, the need of these are huge in alternative livelihoods for the marine, the, the coastal area. The fishermen, when they had to go back to the park area and reserve, the reserve area to fish, they, it's because they didn't have any other alternative livelihood and they only had to seek um, the government to help them so that they can go back to fishing, but still they were under some restriction. Therefore, there's a huge gap. We are, we are, not, we are not prepared for disaster. Therefore, there's a huge gap in alternative livelihood. We need to embrace that as a management action. Um, thank you so much for listening to me. That was my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Big applause. Um, so is there a question by one of our colleagues to Esther? <clears throat> we don't have much time. Um, there's no raised hand. I'll have a quick question. So Esther, do you have any plans to share your results with, uh, with the communities you, you engage with? Sorry? Uh, do you have any plans to share your results with the communities that you engage with in your research? Um, I haven't thought about it yet, but I think that would be a good step. I can only encourage that uh, and encourage it for everyone to share the results, to give something back. Thanks so much, Esther. So uh, next up is Joshina. Um, you want me to share the presentation? I've seen you uploaded it to, uh, to us, or do you want to share it yourself, Joshina? I, I can share it. Perfect. This is this is what. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm here today to talk about um, some components of my dissertation research, which is looking at uh, integrating perceptions of fisheries restrictions and collaborative partnerships to support effective and equitable MPA management in the Republic of Mauritius. And I will. Um, go a bit bigger to just uh, talk about why understanding perceptions, um, so how people feel about these um, forms of management is important and can help us improve uh, our management tools. So my research is based uh, in the Republic of Mauritius, which is a large ocean state with an ocean area that is a thousand times our land mass, which makes marine resource management incredibly important. Um, it is also a biodiversity hotspot. So the two main islands, uh, two main inhabited islands, Mauritius and Rodrigues, form part of the Mascarene ecoregion, which is a global biodiversity hotspot. And uh, this is attributed to the volcanic origin of both islands and millions of years of isolation and, ad and adaptation, which resulted uh, in a diversity of biota, which reflects a high degree of endemism. Um, so just very quickly, uh, why marine protected areas, they are important for climate refuge for many species and they guard against threats like illegal fishing and impacts of climate change by minimizing disturbance. Um, and there's a lot of different resource users who are impacted uh, by marine protected areas, which is why it's um, essential to look at all the different groups. So when we're talking about protection through MPAs, we're talking about protection of natural systems. So all elements of biodiversity, uh, which also includes uh, fisheries. But we are also talking about protection of cultural systems. So for example, artisanal fishing practices, which are a form of intangible cultural heritage for many coastal communities. So it takes me back to uh, this, the Ostrom socio-ecological systems framework, um, where we can see that uh, social and ecological outcomes of interest 
uh, are impacted by social, economic, and political settings. And within the systems, we have uh, the governance system is important. We have all the interactions that eventually affect the outcomes we want to achieve. So in this case, uh, for MPEs, the ecological outcomes we want to achieve are increased fish biomass, coral reef recovery, um, and examples of social outcomes would be increased livelihood from fisheries. But within all that, the cultural context within which users, managers, and policymakers operate and interact is also important. So my focus for this presentation would be on the users. Who are they? How do they identify and relate to the environment? Because it is very important to understand that before we can understand how management affect them and how they can support management practices. So there's increasing inter, uh, scholarship showing how cultural context really matters when we are tackling environmental concerns like climate change and emerging evidence is demonstrating that current policies which overlook these cultural dimensions often, often lead to maladaptive outcomes. So cultural factors shape how people support adaptation interventions and their motivation to uh, respond to them. Additionally, Local support is extremely important for the success, but also longevity of uh, conservation efforts. So my research builds on these works in coupled human natural systems. So why is Mauritius important from a socio-ecological system perspective? So first is the colonial context. Given the multiple waves of uh, colonialism, the um, the, the different times for which people were brought on the island. So just a quick note that Mauritius was not inhabited pr prior to colonization. So we have no uh, indigenous community, uh, but our resources, our people. So the cultural mixture that came from these different waves of colonization and uh, the ethnic mixture that now lives on the island. And um, this is important when we look at how um, you know, people interact differently with the environment. Also is our vulnerability as a small island nation makes Mauritius important uh, from this socio-ecological system outlook. Um, the different governance system on the different islands, our economic context, uh, you know, the fact that we are heavily reliant on tourism, for example. And lastly, all of that together, uh, all of these factors, our colonial history, our vulnerability, um, that affects our cultural and environmental identity. So um, part one of my um, dissertation is actually looking at how has this colonial history influenced cultural and environmental identity on the two main inhabited islands of the Republic of Mauritius. So Mauritius and Rodrigues. Uh, there are some distinct differences we see uh, between these two islands. So. Uh, for the example, uh, Mauritius is more uh, densely populated. Um, there's also a higher dependence on uh, natural resources on Rodriguez Island than Mauritius. And in terms of ethno-religious composition, Mauritius is a lot more heterogeneous than Rodriguez. And it, it, this is important to uh, think about when we think about you know, uh, awareness events or how we are proceeding with uh, consultation practices or community engagement when uh, we approach local communities for um, environmental conservation projects. So to answer this question, uh, I've used a mixed method approach that uh, looks at, um, I use historical analysis for secondary sources to construct a historical timeline of sociopolitical, environmental, and cultural transformation uh, to understand how that history evolved on both islands. Uh, I also use semi-structured interviews with government officials, private companies, and geos to provide context for how these transformations interact with current anthropogenic and climate related pressures like increasing coastal development and overfishing. So um, through the interviews, we have a better sense of collective identity, but also more information about the reported behavior. So it's, it's impossible to measure collective identity. So what we can get to is a perception of that collective identity. 
So I'll, I'm just going to share some of the preliminary interview results. The main themes that came through is the disconnect with the environment in Mauritius compared to Rodrigues. So a lot of people highlighted that disconnect with the natural environment that's probably uh, related to the fact that uh, the main island of Mauritius is more developed and there's, there's more less dependence um, on the natural environment. Uh, the next point is uh, on enforcement. So uh, we can see a lot of similarities when it comes to like uh, marine protected areas, but also like plastic bans or seasonal closures in relation to uh, octopus fisheries. There seem to be uh, more compliance on the island of Rodrigues than uh, compared to Mauritius. So here, for example, uh, one of our respondents said that landing plastic was a bold action. Rodrigues Island did it before Mauritius and they sustained it over time. They enforced it, whereas here in Mauritius, they said, yes, we ban plastic, but it's coming back gradually on the market. So um, enforcement is very much important. And this is something that will come up again when we talk about uh, marine protected areas as well. And lastly is the social and cultural context. So the Commissioner of Fisheries and Environment in Rodrigue had highlighted this, that Rodrigue's between being a mostly Catholic island, the priests have a lot of power. So when they talk about environmental uh, projects, uh, there's a higher, there's a bigger connect with that person who has a lot of influence and they tend to um, show a, a higher degree of, of compliance. And this is something that even the director of a leading environmental NGO in Mauritius has, has mentioned. So like we need to identify what kind of leadership we need to go to, the kind that has more influence so that uh, we are disseminating information about these uh, environmental projects uh, more widely. So some future work on this will include perception of environmental and fisheries management regulations. So uh, this is survey data I'm currently working on understanding a pre-ecological behavior and also mental models of enforcement officers when it comes to uh, managing uh, ocean areas on both these islands. Uh, part two quickly is I looked at community perceptions around marine protected areas in the Republic of Mauritius. So again, on these two islands, and we looked at uh, MPAs of varying levels of restrictions. So we have nationally enforced marine parks, fishing reserves, but also voluntary conservation areas led by uh, NGOs. Um, in Rodrigues Island, there's also a co-managed MPA that had been set up with a lot of a high level of community engagement and where um, there's still uh, surrounding communities are involved in the enforcement. They have rangers who used to be uh, fishers from the region and also community resource observers who tend to accompany uh, enforcement officers uh, during their uh, patrols. So the methods we employed are household surveys uh, on both islands, as well as key informant surveys. And these are the types of questions we ask. So uh, the number of people who typically break rules, the frequency of illegal fishing, uh, the management effect on fishing efforts, among others. Um, and these are the this is how we uh, um, uh, chose our sample for the household survey. So we made sure that there was representation of both fishers and non-fishers for each village. Uh, same for key informant surveys. We ensured that uh, there was a representation of fishing leaders and non-fishing leaders. So we asked about, so one of the components that we asked about was management fairness. And uh, when it comes to marine protected areas on both islands, and um, only 4% thought that uh, these regulations were very fair for both islands. 29% uh, thought they were fair in Mauritius versus only 8% in Rodrigues. And uh, less than 1% thought it was very unfair in Mauritius compared to 5% in Rodrigues. So these are just random numbers right now, but we tried to understand why people chose the responses they did. So the reasons behind the fairness per perception, example in Mauritius, is uh, they said that illegal fishers do not pay any fishing license, hence they should not be allowed to fish. And, uh, the, the registered fishers have more right to fish and to learn to fish sustainably, and it is good for the environment and for everyone. 
uh, in Rodriguez, for example, they said that decisions that have been taken are for our well being. Uh, the regulations are good, but there is poor management and lack of training. And um, they notice no change related in relation to fisheries. So with the area based management uh, regulations, but they notice a positive impact when it comes to seasonal closures of octopus. Uh, when we asked them why they thought it was unfair. So there was a lot of attention put on um, enforcement officers and um, the fact that it's not equitable. So one side cannot be losing while the other side wins and the fact that fisher revenue is affected. Uh, in Rodrigues as well, there was uh, concerns about uh, enforcement and the lack of equal opportunity. So these are important when we uh, design uh, subsequent um, ways of including the community around uh, marine protected areas because uh, I, like islands and countries globally are trying to increase their, their uh, coverage of MPAs. And it is important that we understand uh, how people are reacting to them uh, before we set it up and also while uh, these MPAs are implemented. So uh, I'm continuing this work looking at the impact of COVID and the recent Bacastro oil spill on these community perceptions, but I also look at the management perspective. So we've done this different set of surveys looking at how management uh, think about uh, these um, metrics and also uh, support management and level of agency within these enforcement offices. And lastly, very quickly, uh, I just wanted to highlight this uh, study that was just published, uh, which looks at a citizen science initiative to um, assess the presence of coral and rare coral and reef fish species in Mauritius. And my uh, contribution is in that was to look at environmental perceptions around the island to see where, where we are seeing endemics and where there is higher support for management. So in that way, we should be prioritizing areas where we see support or it would help us just um, approach uh, setting up management areas in those areas differently. So um, we have, so it's again, the same set of surveys around a thousand surveys around these purple dots around the island. Um, and I used the new ecological paradigm to get to uh, understanding pro-ecological behavior. So these are the different things that we ask people about, uh, whether they think we are approaching the limit of the number of people that of can support, uh, whether endemics, endemic plants and animals have a right to exist, uh, or whether um, you know, they think that the environmental issue has been overemphasized. And we look at it at different district level in Mauritius to understand where people seem to have a higher uh, pro-ecological behavior. So um, in, in general, as a whole, Mauritians tend to have a high, uh, strong environmental awareness associated with a number of concerns. And these perceptions were generally uh, widespread, but we noticed district level differences, which may be associated with environmental conditions, associated livelihoods. So for example, some districts are more dependent on fisheries and uh, natural resources than others, and also rural and urban demographic uh, uh, gradients. So- um, Shinar, can you please um, come to an end? Sorry to disturb you, but- No, no problem. Yeah, so uh, for more information around about this, uh, so this, this is the paper that has just been published. And yes, yeah, so my key takeaway here is just to highlight again, the need to uh, you know, do more research about uh, how users are interacting with the governance system and uh, within our social, economic and political setting to have a focus on cultural context, uh, because eventually this affects both social and ecological outcomes. So with that, I would like to thank everyone who supported this study and thank you for your attention. Thanks, Joshina. Hi. <laughs> Very interesting and uh, yeah, was to follow. Um, we're a little bit short behind time, um, but I still want to give the opportunity to raise a question uh, by our colleagues uh, that are here. Yeah. The opportunity now, Hauke. 
short, please. Yes, uh, short. Um, just because we are also talking about the region, I think uh, Mauritius and Rodriguez are quite interesting study sites from an history, uh, historical perspective also, and and how how they were um, colonized. Um, do you think you can use any of that to apply it to other regions uh, in the Western Indian Ocean, the Eastern African coast, for example, yeah, the approach you did? Um, yes, so I will have to do like a deeper dive into the colonial context in other places. But I think one thing that can be uh, generalized is like looking at more homogeneous communities versus more heterogeneous ones. and. But there were also fa other factors into play, like dependence on uh, level of dependence on natural resources and the rural urban divide. Mm -hmm. So uh, depending on the context, if we get get to uh, these factors, uh, we could uh, that the, the, these results could help us extrapolate to these other areas. Cool. Thanks. Right. Thanks. Hope Thanks. it was fast enough. Yeah, I know it was good. Uh, also, again, very interesting presentation and very uh, nice to follow. Very clear. Um, so next up, thanks again, Drashina, is uh, Nancy. Um, I have your presentation. Do you want me to share it or do you want to share it yourself? I you can share it. Okay, let me try. <coughs> Maybe you can start by introducing yourself while I set, set it up. Okay. So hi, everyone. My name is Nancy Ogega. Currently, I'm a final year student at Kenyatta University, Kenya. Uh, could you start? So just tell me, do the next slide, please. OK. So I hope you can all you can all hear me. Okay. We can hear. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So my topic is social ecological resilience indicators of coastal communities to climate change in Kenya. Yeah, you can go to the next slide. Okay. Marine ecosystems are very important. So I think uh, you are muted. I can't hear you. I don't know about the others. No, no sound, Nancy. Still muted. Yes. No. Thanks. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. So let me start. Okay, marine ecosystems are very important to coastal communities because of the services that they provide. And with this, I mean the mangroves, the corals, and the seagrasses. Okay, next slide, please. Um, the when I say that they're, they're, that they are important to coastal communities, I mean like the wildlife, they, they, their wildlife habitat to to fish, invertebrates, microorganisms. They also pro protect the coastline. They provide food to the coastal communities and even job opportunities. However, these ecosystems are being endangered all over the world, mainly by human activities such as overfishing, destructive fishing, pollution sedimentation and even climate change. Uh, climate change is being recognized as the biggest threats to these ecosystems. Uh, the coastal ecosystems are already dealing with significant changes from the sea level rise to the coastal storms and even the loss of coastal resources. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Um, Climate change poses a great threat to the marine ecosystems, making these coastal communities vulnerable to the disturbances that they face. So they need to prepare these communities in adapting and mitigating to the effects of the climate change while still maintaining the resilience of the marine ecosystems. 
So there's also need to identify the indicators that we can use to assess the social ecological resilience of the coastal communities. Understanding the social ecological resilience of the coastal communities to climate change is crucial because it helps in manage, making management decisions on the resource use and also improving the livelihoods of the people. Uh, my problem here is climate change. And uh, with this, we have, we have to identify, we, have, we want to know how uh, these coastal communities in Kenya are resilient to the climate change that is affecting them. So they, uh, come, I have to come up, we have to come up with the indicators that we can use to assess uh, the social ecological resilience status of the coastal communities. So these indicators will enable the assessment of, of the social ecological resilience status to take place. Okay, my general objective was to identify the indicators used to assess the social ecological resilience of coastal communities to climate change in Kenya. My specific objectives were first is to identify what indicators are used to as assess the resilience of coastal community, communities uh, to climate change, that is globally. And my second objective was also to identify the social ecological resilience indicators that can be applied in Kenya because you can have uh, an indicator, yes, it can, it's, it's an indicator, it's considered as an indicator, but it's, it, it cannot be used or it's not applicable in Kenya. Okay, we go, can go to the next slide. So my research question, what indicators are commonly used to assess the social ecological resilience of the coastal communities to climate change in Kenya? And what are the priority indicators that can be used or applied in Kenya? Next slide, please. Uh, methodology. Uh, this study used a uh, secondary data where I reviewed literature to come up or to yes, to come up with the indicators that can be used global that are used globally to assess social ecological resilience data. So um, my next step was also um, a systematic literature review was conducted using Google and Google Scholar using variables of the indicators, such as the searching keywords and the word social ecological resilience coastal communities Kenya were added. Okay, an example is maybe an indicator was governance. So governance, the word governance was my, my, my keyword. But uh, next I add social ecological resilience coastal communities Kenya. Okay, literature was came through there papers that were searched using the Google Scholar. Uh, the first 30 papers I searched skimmed the literature. This was, I was skimming the abstract and the results so, so that I can find out whether there's any concept of the specific variable that I'm interested in. So for example, my indicator is governance. And uh, yes, my indicator is governance, for example. I made such a paper on Google Scholar. Yes, it will give me a lot of papers talking of, you know, talking of, of governance, but my interest is the link that it has with social ecological resilience. So I have to I had to skim through the abstract and the results so that so that I can find if there's any concept of my interest. And from there, the number of papers that talked of the specific variables, I listed them and also I used. Microsoft Excel tools to find the average. Yeah, you can, you can go to the next. So these are my results. I found far from the results, five dimensions and 25, indi 25 indicators. And in, in each indicator, there are, there, are not, there are variables. Okay, the variables are like 90, so I couldn't list them here. But uh, each indicator, they have different number of variables. Like community bonds, it has different number of variables than safety and well-being. OK, you can go to the next slide. So from the papers that I got, uh, I had to um, my, remember my first, my second uh, objective is to identify the priority indicators that I can use to that can be applied in Kenya. So from the, the using Excel sheet tools, I came up with a, re, a representation of the, as you can see here, the social dimensions, 
uh, the indicators, the physical dimensions, their indicators, and from them, the indicators that scored the highest. So like uh, in social dimension, the le leading indicator was uh, scoring 33%. So that one is what I picked as my leading indicator, same as the physical dimension and, and this institutional, economic, and environmental dimension. Uh, yes, you can go to the next slide. Same as institutional dimension here, my, yes, yes, thank you. The high, my highest indicator was scoring 30% and the environmental, my highest indicator was scoring 19%. Next. Next, next, this is the problem yeah, okay. From, from the results shown above, uh, I'm only, uh, my only interest were the, uh, the, the top priority indicators. So from the social dimension, like the indicators that scored the highest were the community bonds and social support that, what, that was leading 33%, uh, still under this social dimension, the responsive and preventive health measures also was the second indicator that is coming after the, the first, that was scoring 30%. Physical dimension, again, from the results shown above, the indicator infrastructure efficiency was the leading indicator with 54%. Uh, this, this was contributed mainly by the status of the critical infrastructure. Uh, you can go to the next slide. And also on the institutional dimension, collaboration was found to be the leading indicator with 30%. And uh, Mm, among the government, yes, and non uh, the coordination among government departments in Kenya and non governmental was also found to be a main contributing factor under uh, and institutional dimension. Okay, under the environmental dimension, the indicators environmental safeguard measures and marine restoration were the highest, leading indicators of 19%. And under the economic, my leading indicator was security and stability with a 45%. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Okay, my conclusion is now my, my, my top indicators that I, I was looking for, or that were my interest. Now the first two of each dimension, first two of the social dimension, physical, institutional, economic, to come up with the top 10 priority indicators that I'm interested in. And they were the community bonds, the collaboration governance, dynamism, security and stability infrastructure, environmental safeguard measures and wasteland protection. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Okay, I'd like to acknowledge and express my sincere gratitude to Dr. Juliet Carissa, that is my mentor from Kemfri, Sole Abud from Kodio and Dr. Frederick Tamo, Kenyatta University. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, applause to Nancy for this presentation. Um, is there any question? I can't uh, see uh, if there's a question in, no question in the chat. How can you want to ask a question? Uh, yeah, I think those are really uh, interesting findings that you made there in in this literature study. Um, are you are you planning on on uh, using them uh, to influence policy making and decision making in the in the region or trying to to upscale it and bring it to a more practical level? Um, Um, I'm planning to, now that I have the indicators, I'm planning to localize them, like in a certain, maybe a certain community in Kenya. Cool. Yeah, it would be really nice to see the results uh, of that if you test it in practice. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you, Nancy. Um, next up is Obakain. Are you there, Obakeng? Uh, I can see that you started screen sharing. Great. Can't hear you though yet. Okay, I was unmuting. 
Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Go ahead. It's sorry, my lighting is really bad. That's okay. We can. Um, but your presentation is still. I need to just quickly. It does. Okay, there we go. So hi everyone. Uh, my name is Oregon. And um, I'm working, I'm a co-investigator in the project Bandari Bora, which means smart ports. Um, and then um, the study is based in Mombasa as well as in Durban. But I'll be presenting a fact sheet. So our fact sheet, just, okay, there we go. So our fact sheet um, that we made um, was from a stakeholder engagement that we did in July this year in Diani. So um, firstly, to give you a background on our project, um, the full title of the project is the Spatial Planning of Climate Smart and Resilient Port Cities in the Y region, a case of Mombasa and Durban. So the two main objectives are to evaluate the impact of port development um, and operations on urban social ecology, social economy, and social spatial arrangements. And the second one is to determine the spatial and temporal changes in land use and land cover change in the selected port cities. So the tools that we are currently, so right now, as we speak, I'm now in Mombasa, I'm currently in Mombasa, and we are collecting data. So the main tools that we are using are state, we, we, did, we did the stakeholder engagement first so that we can talk to the stakeholders, find out what their needs are and what type of data or information do they require from us. That way, um, our study is not one-sided, but then we're working together with the different stakeholders. And then from that stage, then that, that information we got from the engagement informed um, our semi-structured open-ended interviews, the land use survey, the household survey, the business survey, the focus group discussion we'll be having next week and the ongoing geospatial tools that we're doing. So um, the, um, this is a picture from the stakeholder engagement. So the people, the stakeholders that were at our meeting were firstly from government agencies. So on a localized level from the county, we had the transport department, planning, tourism, as well as fisheries. National department, national, we had Kenya port authorities, Kenya Maritime Authority, as well as somebody from the environmental, environmental departments at national as well as local government. And then the private sector is very important, um, but at the engagement, we only had um, one individual, which was Susan, and um, she's from the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. Then we would use her as our entry point into the private sector and accessing other agencies. Um, and other companies there. And then environmental conservation and activism. So these are local um, companies or local like, and research, research institutions. And then lastly, the community, which is very important as communities are highly impacted by port development, city development, and the different policies that have been implemented now in Kenya. Um, so these are just um, part, that's just an indicator of some of the work that we were doing during the stakeholder engagement, when we also asked the stakeholders to map on a map to show us where, where their activities are actually having an impact in Mombasa, so that we can have a clear geographical picture of where are they, where are they doing wrong or where their impact is. Um, and also, they were also able to tell us which other stakeholders are actually impacting their activities or their, or their environment, or even the people living in the different areas of Mombasa. So um, the facts for Mombasa are as follows. So this is Mombasa, and then there's six sub-counties in Mombasa. So Mombasa Island is in Vita, and then um, we are based in Nyadi. So um, this is just some of the basic information and that one of the main things is that the city is highly congested. This is from the tra transport um, department and 45% of um, residents actually use public transport. And the highest, and at the moment, Bombasa has the highest traffic congestion. And one of the other problems is that there's a 
very high use of tuk-tuks as well as bora boras. So that's what is mainly on the roads and causing some of this congestion. And the impacts are that one of the some of the impacts are that this low um, the impact is that this low governance. Um, so there's a lack of structured and sustained implementation um, of the available master plans, whether it be the port master plan or city or different city master plans in transport as well as housing development. And um, this weak enforcement of some of the laws of the laws that are um, gazetted. And um, there's increasing emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, and then. In terms of infrastructure, the rate of port logistics growth is not compatible with the city infrastructure, which means that the port is developing much quicker than the city can, the city, than the city. So the city is not catching up, which is also a problem, especially when you look at the traffic, the amount of roads that have been fixed, and the new highways that are also being constructed relative to people living in the city as well as what's happening inside the port. So um, in terms of um, the recommendations and current projects that are currently, that are ongoing now in Mombasa is that um, they are implementing a bus rapid transit system. This one, this is aimed at reducing the amount of tuk-tuks and bora boras on the road. Um, there's technology, they're using quite a bit of technology in monitoring the transport and traffic controls. Um, there is currently the Mombasa Gate Bridge, which interlinks Mombasa Island as well as the mainland. So this is to also reduce traffic on some of the roads. And um, one of another one is the Gate City Master Plan, which is um, supported by the Japanese government. So this one aims to address issues of traffic congestion, poor drainage, infrastructure development, and physical trade, physical planning. And then one of the interesting things is that there's also a carbon, an urban carbon sink in Mombasa, which is um, by Bamburi Cement or Lafarge Ecosystems. So um, you can go hiking in that area. This is the largest area and which is the greenest. So um, you can even go there as a tourist. There's a lot of tourists who are going there and locals go there for hiking. So there's um, fish ponds and um, there's even hippopotami. Um, 430 vegetation species. So it used to be, it, they're still also mining there, but then um, the whole area has been, has undergone um, ecosystem restoration and, and is under biodiversity conservation, um, which is how the Fudge ecosystems is turning around um, their production as well. So by changing the land and restoring some of, a lot of the land um, moving on to the Kenya Port Authority. So um, it's at from national level, um, they are in charge of port operations, maintaining port facilities, um, aids to navigation, regulation of, and regulation of port businesses. So the problems coming from the facts and the problems that were raised from the port were mainly that um, there's inadequate data, which is where we coming in. So there's lack of data on how beach management units and fishermen are affected by port development. And um, it was important for us to learn about this. That way we are able to now contribute to their data needs. Um, that's why it's more of a, that's why it was important to have the stakeholder engagement. Um, we're now aware of the increased conflict due to land ownership and resettlement issues. For example, Dongangkundu area, which is um, a special economic zone that is being constructed at the moment, which is near the port, near the airport, um, and on the other side of the port. And um, another issue, for example, um, is also the fact that um, there's a need for raw materials. So a lot of the raw materials are coming through the port. So um, access to raw materials, how quick are the raw materials moving from the port to the different industries? This is something that um, they want to find out how to make things easier for the movement of raw materials um, from the time they enter the port um, until they get to where they are needed. But this also creates a problem of, for example, in Kilifi County, where um, the extraction of raw materials is having an impact on Jirubani forest. Um, lastly, um, this slide just looks at the social spatial perspective of our study. 
So from the, from the um, stakeholder engagement, we now, um, we've learned quite a lot and some of the things that we have, we are now looking into in our study um, is that um, code, is that the importance of code designing um, for the port city is that um, the laws, the laws that are currently in place are giving county governments more power to regulate development within their jurisdiction. And this law was the Fiscal and Land Use Planning Act of 2019. Um, um, we need to also, they need help um, in terms of policy on what changes can be made to the current land zoning policies. Um, how, can, how can we contribute data and information towards reducing environmental impact? Um, how can we create efficient movement of goods and services, um, especially between the port and the different industries, as well as outside of Mombasa, outside of Mombasa to the other counties and to the other countries that depend on the port. And then also lastly, we also would like to help them and the city in increasing the livability standards of people living in the port city, because there's quite a lot of this urban sprawl and more and more people want to live in the port city, and which is creating pressure on land use planning, development and transport systems, as well as the environment. Um, I try my best to keep it as short as possible. Um, thank you very much. These are just pictures of Old Fort, which also has its own range of problems due to urban sprawl, um, old buildings. Some of the buildings are actually um, just toppling over by themselves. So these are just one of the many problems that are being dealt with in Mombasa. So I hope the fact sheet provided everybody with enough facts. And even if you're a tourist, you become aware of some of the challenges that are being dealt with by policymakers, researchers, and people living in Mombasa. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ubakeng. Um, so now we have to take questions. Um, I can't hear you, Rebecca. Oh, maybe Halku can take over. Can you hear me? Because I, yes. I, I could hear Rebecca. Okay. Um, yeah, is there any questions from, from the audience? I don't see any in the chat. Um, um, so it sounds like you created a nice community of stakeholders there that is engaging uh, on this development process. Was this like a a one-time thing or is this community still going because I mean port development is a, a process that takes a long time and it will affect the city and the, the communities for for quite some some time afterwards as well um, is, are you constantly meeting with them and updating uh, the feedback and um, so at the moment um, because I'm since I'm here we already we've planned key informant interviews for the next three weeks so we'll be going back to them again. And um, in terms of, from, for example, the household survey, we consulted with some of the stakeholders. Um, so they got to see the household survey. Um, we're using an app. So we also developed an app um, to collect the data easier. So then, so that they could say um, all the data is fine um, or whatever they needed, they were also able to add it to the household survey in case there's certain data that they needed. So we are we are in constant communication with the stakeholders, and they are aware of the fact that we're doing our data collection now. Ah, cool. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. All right. There is another question in the chat, um, Rebecca. If you want me to continue? Um, yeah. So it's from Gabriel. Um, and the question is, how involved are the women and youth in the port involvement, uh, development issues? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. So, <laughs> I, I, <can't. laughs> um, I know for, for example, um, firstly, there's a high unemployment rate. Um, I'm not sure. I think port development is helpful for women in terms of um, informal businesses. So when we did a drive around, um, a lot of them are selling food, 
a lot of them are actually selling food at different parts of the port entrances. So that so the increasing port development and more people coming in and out of the port is probably helping them there. So there's an informal market. And um, that's why we also want to do a business survey to look at what is the prevalence of informal versus formal businesses. And then in terms of youth, um, I'm, I am not sure, but what we did is that um, our field workers are predominantly youth. Also, um, it's um, graduates who are living in Mombasa who have been unemployed for a while. So they are the ones who are actually helping us in our study. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much, Obakang. Really interesting. Ezra. Posted a question in the chat if the fact sheet is available already or if it's still in, in production, so to say. Um, so if it's online, maybe you can let us know where we can find it. And um, now we are up with our last uh, talk by Lily Baumann about transdisciplinary coastal research in the Global South, a systematic literature review. Uh, Lily, do you want me to share the screen or um, do you want to share? Uh, I can share the screen myself, I think. If I get there. Yeah. Spotlight. So far, I can't uh, reach it, I think. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Like if I if I do it now, I just like you just see my screen, but I want you to see the presentation. So normally this is, uh, yeah, maybe you share it then if it does not work like that. <laughs> just tell me when to uh, go. Yeah, I try. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, maybe start with introducing yourself and then. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, yes. Hi, uh, I'm Lily. I'm a bachelor's student of environmental sciences at Leuphana University uh, in Germany. And currently I'm in the north of Norway for an exchange semester. And last semester I, together with another student, uh, Rike Schneider, and the help of our supervisor, Maria Richas, did a literature review on transdisciplinary coastal research in the global south, which we haven't finished yet. And originally, Rico wanted to do this presentation, but for personal reasons, she can't, so I do it now. And uh, the topic of my bachelor thesis is how the review papers dealt with anticip anticipation of the future. And in this presentation, I will mainly focus on my results on that topic. But my bachelor thesis isn't ready yet, so I'm very open and happy about your feedback and thoughts on my topic. And next slide, please. Um, so this is my structure. I will give you a short introduction, then show you my methods, some of my results, and have a short conclusion. Um, as I already mentioned, my bachelor thesis is part of the literature review, which is carried out from the working group anticipating and transforming future coasts from with the German Committee for Sustainability Research. And the overall li literature review will get published also at some time uh, from the working group. Uh, but I focused on the topic anticipation of the future, and my research question is how far do transdisciplinary approaches in coastal research in the global south take anticipation of the future into account? And uh, as I don't know how familiar, you can go one more before. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, as I don't know how familiar you are with the concepts I mentioned, uh, I will shortly explain them. So for myself, I define anticipation as process or concept for engaging with, adapting to, or shape uncertain futures. And uh, for the concept of transdisciplinarity, uh, you can obviously find many different definitions as we already heard them, I think. So um, to find the papers, we used a very broad definition of transdisciplinarity. Uh, which is that the study included one of the aspects of collaboration, synthesis of knowledge, or making change happen. So transdisciplinary research is mainly about working together with people from different scientific and non-scientific backgrounds and integrate different uh, knowledge types. And in the beginning, we wanted to do a worldwide literature review, but uh, it would have been too big. So we decided to focus on the Global South countries because the tro uh, tropics are the main area of interest for the working group 
and less studies on this topic were published in these countries. Uh, so now I go through my methods. Um, as I already mentioned, uh, we did the systematic literature review and followed the preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analysis, in short, PRISMA. And first, we developed a search string consisting of different categories. Um, this search string then was put into Scopus da database, which led to 1,117 papers. Um, we then developed inclusion and exclusion criteria and scanned the abstracts abstracts of these papers, which led to the inclusion of around half of them, which were not suitable for the topic. And in the next step, uh, coding, coding categories were developed. And I will later show you some of my codes in the results. And then the papers were downloaded and I looked only at 50% of them. And already uh, while coding excluded 93 more, ending up with 134 papers for the overall review and 31 papers which used anticipation methods where I focused on. And afterwards, the codes were analyzed with uh, quantitative and qualitative uh, content analysis. So now I show you some of my results. Um, you can go, yeah. <laughs> this uh, graph shows you the distributions of countries, all um, of all the reviewed papers uh, where the studies were conducted in. And the darker the blue, the more often the study was done in this country. Um, most studies were realized in Bangladesh with 11 studies, followed by Indonesia, Philippines, and Vietnam. And in all continents with uh, global South countries, projects could be found. Uh, but as you can see, most of them were conducted in Asia. And for each continent, the studied ecosystem also gets pictured here, and most studies were conducted in general ecosystems, which means that no specific ecosystem type was mentioned, whereas the study was in a coastal area and had a, copy, a topic with coastal relation, uh, for example, fishing, flooding, shrimp farming, and uh, mangrove ecosystems were studied second often, and on the different continents, you see that there are different uh, trends concerning the ecosystem types. Uh, you can go to the next slide. And another code was called Step of the Transform Framework. So uh, the Transform Framework was developed by Lang et al. and consists out of four steps, uh, which show a process, process of an ideal um, transdisciplinary research process for transformation. And uh, the first step is the past and current state analysis, followed by scenario construction and assessment and visioning research and lastly, intervention research. Uh, through qualitative content analysis, it was analyzed to which of the steps of the framework the study belonged to. And of the 134 papers included in the broader literature review, 60% did the past and current state analysis. And as the first step, uh, as the first step of the transform framework and uh, the second stage scenario construction and assessment was done by 30 studies and the least used uh, was the third step, which is visioning research um, with only three papers and intervention research um, as the last step was done by 41 studies. And it is not remarkable that the past and current state analysis was most often done because it's the first step and it's also the basis, basis for following steps and could get used for subsequent studies. But in my further analysis, I additionally analyzed which transform framework steps got combined in the different studies. Um, and this showed also that many studies uh, combine the first step and the last steps while missing the part of scenario construction and assessment and also of visioning research. Uh, but the transform framework tells that these are important steps for a successful like transformation kind of. And um, this could, in the worst case, lead to inadequate um, interventions. And yeah, in the next step, uh, in the next slide, we uh, have a closer look at uh, these two steps because I think they are especially relevant. And uh, here, um, the following results, uh, they come from the 31 papers uh, which used anticipation methods. So before it was 134 and now it's only 31 papers. 
And one coding category uh, asked for the aims for using an anticipation method, which got mentioned in the studies. And for example, the aim was to enhance uh, stakeholder knowledge and participation or to explore and evaluate future. And furthermore, to enhance system understanding or provide guidance for planning. Other aims were to motivate action, to um, imagine alternative futures, or to discover future economic benefits and challenges. And I think that these findings highlight the importance and also relevance of anticipation in the context of transdisciplinary coastal research. And next slide, please. Um, in the review papers, uh, various methods were used to engage with the future. And for analysis, the specific uh, methods were grouped in broader categories, which can be seen in the results. And the most common method was scenario construction and scenario assessment. Another method used is modeling, which was in some cases framed as participatory modeling, uh, including stakeholders in this research step. Uh, stakeholder preferences to particular scenarios were researched in five cases. <coughs> Sorry. And methods which did not fit into the broader categories uh, were framed as other and included, for example, fuzzy cognitive mapping, uh, joint plausibility discussions, role playing games, or SWOT analysis. And looking at the methods, it can be seen again that visioning more diverse futures does not get used very often. Also, the inclusiveness of stakeholders varied in the papers a lot, but uh, this is more Rika's part, what she did. And yeah, now I come already to my conclusion. So um, many studies don't do any anticipation uh, methods at all and do not consider the future perspective that much. And if they consider future, they mostly do scenarios and miss the part of visioning more diverse futures uh, together with stakeholders. But anticipation methods could have some opportunities for transdisciplinary coastal research um, as they help for planning and guidance, uh, guidance for interventions. And they can get used to engage with different stakeholders and motivate them to look into the future and also take action. So far, the methods were not very diver diverse, and it was mostly looked at plausible futures, but not on more diverse futures, which gets done in visioning, for example. And also the level of stakeholder particip participation uh, varied a lot. And I think uh, it would be important to do more transdisciplinary anticipation research in this context to develop solutions for current challenges and problems in coastal re regions. And uh, yeah, now I'm open for your questions and would like to hear your opinions on my topic. And maybe you have some ideas. And yeah, thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Lily. Uh, it was really interesting. Um, you made a good point that, um, yeah, we are missing out on anticipation, looking into the future uh, with our research. Um, I want to take uh, questions from my colleagues. Uh, I know we are behind time and it's supposed to be your break, but I, uh, yeah, just if you're interested to know more about Lily's uh, research, please um, ask a question. There's one in the chat. Thanks for the presentation, Lily. How do you differentiate scenarios and visioning? Mm, yes, uh, like. I do differentiate scenarios and visioning. Um, so scenarios are most of the time, um, they look for plausible futures. Like if uh, something, like you have some parameters and you put them maybe into a model or something and then you uh, get out some scenarios, like maybe one or two or three. So uh, it's more about the, if they are plausible, what could happen? And visions are more broader, like um, you maybe have uh, many different visions and you can also like imagine futures which are um, like much more diverse and maybe not that plausible, but uh, if you imagine them, then you can maybe get close to them. And I think that's very important. Um, I don't know if this answered your question, but yeah, they are just- yeah, that was that made many things very clear. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Thanks so much. <clears throat> so uh, thanks again to um, all of our exciting female speakers and their interesting research. Um, yeah, it was a great pleasure to host this session. Also, thank you to Hauke, who was co-hosting. Um, yeah, now you are you can leave for a very short break, and there will be um, the next streams starting in five minutes. Um, okay, get a coffee, and I'll share the links to the um, to the next sessions in a second in the chat. But you're happy to sign off now. Thanks again.